Hello, I am delighted to be with you once again to study God's Word. I want to start with a brief announcement. You've probably heard that Wes Jackson will be back next week on May 31st for in-person church services. I am just delighted at the prospect of being with my church family once again, so that will begin next week on May 31st. However, small groups will not meet together for a few more weeks, so I will continue to make these videos available for as long as they are needed. Um, let's pray for Pastor Andy and Pastor Steve, Pastor Lonnie, and the others as they help us transition back to in-person worship. Uh, but until then, let's grab our Bibles, maybe a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and see what we can learn from the Word of God together this morning. Our topic for the day is Yield. And we will be looking at the wonderful chapter 2 of Philippians. And I thought as I was thinking about yielding, the main point of the lesson is to humbly yield to others, serving them in humility. And it made me think of the motto for the Deborah Sunday School class, which is right here, the motto, God first, others second, and ourself last. And that is really a beautiful encapsulation of the lesson for today, is that we really want to put God first, others next, and ourselves last. We want to yield in every way. So before we look at our passage in Philippians, I want to give just a little bit of background information about the church at Philippi. It started with the Macedonian call, that wonderful passage in Acts where Paul was called specifically by the Holy Spirit to go to Macedonia. Philippi is one of the major cities in the colony of Macedonia, and Paul was called there by the Holy Spirit to preach to those people. I want to look briefly at that passage in Acts and just make a couple of points from it before we go to Philippians. Okay, so Paul, when they, Paul and his team, had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, why wasn't Paul allowed to go to these other places? Why wasn't he allowed to go to Asia or these other places mentioned here? Why was he called specifically to Macedonia? I don't know, but God knows. And as I said, this, this Macedonian call has fascinated me for much of my life, and I am reminded when I read that passage that if the Lord closes a door and directs me in another place, I need to be so, so open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, so willing to listen to how the Holy Spirit might lead and guide me, because great blessings might await when I follow His plan instead of the plan that I had. Certainly that was the case for Paul. He found great blessings in Macedonia. The people of Philippi were a particular blessing to him, as we'll see in this book. The book of Philippians is actually one of the most encouraging and the most loving books that Paul wrote. And there really was not much doctrinal error in, in Philippi that Paul needed to address, as in many of his letters. Not a lot of doctrinal error in Philippi. Um, instead, he was writing just to encourage them to keep on doing what they were doing, to keep the faith, to grow in the faith. Um, he wrote in appreciation for the gifts that they sent him. You get the sense that it was just a very loving, appreciative, uh, joyful relationship that Paul had with the Philippians. So it really is a delightful book to read, and that is a bit of the background. So with that in mind, let's take a look at that second chapter, starting with the first verse. We read here that if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. First of all, this word if that occurs many times 
in this first section really can be better understood as since. So the idea is that because or since Christ has given us encouragement, consolation, comfort, fellowship, affection, mercy, then we need to have that same goal. We need to encourage others. We need to console and comfort others. We need to show others affection and mercy and follow the example of Christ in doing all of this. That is the admonition here. And again, we have the best example of all. Since Christ did all these things for us, we want to do these things for others. Let's look at another section here. Um, I think it's interesting that when Paul says focusing on one goal, he doesn't specifically mention a particular goal or what that goal should be. One can imagine that the goal would be spreading the word of Christ. That's always a worthy goal. The church needs to be on mission and needs to be about that uh, great commission goal of, of sharing the word of Christ. However, I do think that different churches, just like different individuals, can have different focuses. And so whatever body of Christ, whatever local body of Christ the Lord has placed you in, you need to be of one mind with those people, working towards one purpose. And, and I love that fact about the Word of God, how, how different churches have different personalities. I've had the privilege of moving some during my life and being a member of different churches, and each one had a little bit of a different flavor of how they went about things, and I've learned from each one of those churches that I've been a part of, and it's been a blessing to me. And so we need to work together in whatever body of believers we're in to find that goal and to find that purpose and work as a team in unity, encouraging one another, serving one another, yielding to one another under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful um, goal for us. It's also interesting to me that doing all of this will fulfill the joy of Paul. Fulfill my joy, Paul says. And I think it's interesting that when when people that we love or that we've been mentors to or perhaps the parents of, uh, people that were sort of a little bit a leader to, when they do the right thing, we do feel such joy. I know as a teacher, I feel joy when my students do the right thing. Um, any group that I've ever had any leadership role in, I feel such pleasure when they do the right thing. Most of all, as a mother, I feel such tremendous joy when my children do the right thing. And I think that's the idea here that we see from Paul, that it does bring him such great joy as really the leader, the founder of this church at Philippi when they do the right thing. And indeed, this church did bring him a tremendous amount of joy. Let's look at these last couple of verses. Um, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Humility, of course, gets at that idea of yielding, which is our, um, our really goal for the week, our main study for the week. And humility is a really interesting word. It's not a word that our world necessarily prizes a lot. Um, we do tend to value it. Even worldly people tend to recognize humility in other people and admire it. Uh, most of the world, for example, admires Mother Teresa, people like that that are well known for their humility and their good works. Uh, but in general, being humble is not something that, that the worldly groups aspire to. On a whim, I looked earlier today at Amazon.com and the number of books on humility versus the number of books on self-esteem. I found 6,000 books came up, over 6,000, when I searched for humility, which was actually more than I expected. But when I searched for self-esteem, I found over 70,000. So 6,000 on humility, over 70,000 on self-esteem. And I think that reflects the relative importance the world places on those two concepts. The world is very interested in self-esteem, not quite as interested in humility. But as Christians, we don't always follow the worldly ways, and we're called to humility. We are called to put others above ourselves. And of course, we need to have a healthy sense of self, but we really need to be much more concerned about others than we are about ourselves. And I think that's um, such a, that's really what Paul is saying here, is in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Let's see what else is here. And, and this just expands on that idea. Let's be busy looking about the interests of others more so than our own interest. Um, and no matter what words you use, self-esteem versus humility, pride versus yielding, 
The idea is we want to look after the interests of others, and that is so important. It brings to mind uh, the passage in John when John the Baptist says he, speaking of Jesus, must increase, but I, speaking of himself, John the Baptist, must decrease. Christ must increase, I must decrease. This was an answer John the Baptist gave in response to some of his disciples who were a little bit concerned that Jesus was starting to get all the attention at this point in John the Baptist's ministry. But John the Baptist was quick to say and to recognize that he is the one that that is worthy of the attention. The rest of us who are his followers, his disciples, in the case of John the Baptist, his forerunner, we are simply pointing the way to Christ. He must increase we must decrease. And that is a beautiful expression of humility. So let's look then at the next verse in Philippians 2, verse 5. And it says, make your own attitude like that of Christ Jesus. Make your attitude. This implies a little bit of effort. There are some other uh, versions of the Bible, some other translations of the Bible that actually say adopt this attitude that belongs in Christ, that is the mind of Christ Jesus, adopt it. Now, as the mother of two adopted children, I can tell you what you already surely know. Adoption does not take place by accident. Adoption requires a considerable amount of work. It requires time and effort. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, it really is a very intentional process that unfolds over time. And I like that word here. I like that translation of verse 5 because we need to adopt this mind of Christ Jesus. And to me, that implies this is something we have to work at. Humility is not something that comes naturally to most of us. Humility is not really the natural human condition. Prideful self-centeredness is the more natural condition of fallen man. But when we're saved, placed in the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ, he can help us develop in ourselves the mind of Christ. We can adopt that mind of Christ, of humility, and that is what we're called to. The next few verses of Philippians 2 are a beautiful, beautiful expression of the great humility that Christ himself showed. And of course, this is our ultimate example. Um, so let's read these. So we want to make our attitude that of Christ Jesus or adopt the attitude of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Well, there's no greater humility than that. What, what an incredible picture of humility. Uh, for some reason, a very different form of humility came to my mind as I was reading these verses earlier today in preparation for this lesson. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the television show Undercover Boss. I haven't seen it very often, but I have watched a few episodes, and the premise is the CEO of a company goes undercover, and he works with some either entry-level employees or maybe frontline employees uh, without them knowing his identity, and excuse me. And in doing so, he learns some things about their job, but he humbles himself. They don't know who he is, and sometimes he's frankly not very good at the job that he's doing. Uh, and he learns, and he finds out what it's like to work in some of the lower level positions in the company. And it, it ends up being a good experience for him. So I just wanted to make a cup draw a couple of similarities all, all comparisons are a little bit weak when we're comparing to the lord jesus but i want to draw a couple of similarities between um, the humility shown by the ceo on undercover boss and the humility shown uh, by jesus of course we have to be so careful because there's really no comparison but first of all the undercover boss his his um, humility is voluntary he didn't have to do that, but he chose to go and learn from people in this company. He chose to put himself uh, under their authority to learn from these who did jobs that he maybe had never done so that he could see what it was like to work on the front lines far away from his uh, somewhat exalted office. Similarly, Jesus chose voluntarily to come to earth. No one had to force him to come. He gave up everything. He gave up his position 
as a member of the triune Godhead. Of course, he continued to be God. He was fully God, fully man, but he laid aside all the trappings of, of the royalty of the Godhead that, that belonged rightfully to him. He voluntarily laid those aside to come to earth and live in a very limiting human body. He did that voluntarily for us, and that really is amazing, just amazing when you think about it. So that's one thing. It was a voluntary humility. The other thing is, um, the other similarity I would draw carefully, and then I'm going to say a couple more things. The other similarity is uh, both the undercover boss and Jesus end up giving gifts. Now, the undercover boss, one of the sweetest parts of the show at the end is he brings people in that he worked with that helped him learn lessons, um, he reveals who he was to them, and then he often gives them things that they really need, that he found out from being with them that they needed. Perhaps he gives a car, or perhaps he pays off someone's mortgage. The gifts vary from episode to episode, and again, I've only watched a few, but it, it's interesting that he gives gifts because he sees that people have needs, and he just appreciates their work. Of course, Jesus came bearing the greatest gift of all, he offers us the gift of salvation because he came to live that perfect, sinless life so that when we then rely on him for sinless perfection, he gives us his, his righteousness in exchange for our total lack of righteousness. And through faith in him, we can live forever um, in heaven with God. And that, of course, is a great gift. The undercover boss cannot compete with that, of course. Um, so there are those couple of similarities. It's a voluntary humility, and it also is a humility that results in great gifts for those who encounter um, these, these humble servants, if you will. Now, there's also some differences that I want to be clear in pointing out. For one thing, the undercover boss, I, I don't know how it works. He's probably undercover for a few days or maybe a couple of weeks. Jesus gave up his royal throne for 33 years. That's a very big difference, and that is a huge commitment and a huge gift of love to us. Um, also, there's a big difference between just going from a CEO, which is a big position, sure, but there's a big difference between going from a CEO, human position, although a high one, um, to being a frontline worker. And it's, you know, you're still, still human, right? But just going to a lower position in the company and doing what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He gave up, again, his godly throne. He didn't give up his godly nature. He was still God and still man, but he gave up his rightful position to be a, a very lowly human. That is an incredible gift and, and again, a big difference. Um, another thing I think that's different, very different, is Jesus' experience ended in death, and he knew that it would. Um, he, he gladly and willingly went to the cross for us, which is far more than... Um, than you know, the undercover boss ever did. So again, it's a very weak comparison, but I, I think it's interesting. But I think perhaps also very importantly, another difference is the undercover boss at the end of the show tends to talk about things he learned from working with his workers, and that's totally the opposite of our Lord Jesus Christ. We learn from him. In humility, we follow his example, and we learn from him, and it's, it's really a beautiful thing. So again, lots of contrast there, but again, a, a little bit of similarity, and I just thought it was kind of fun to think of that show and think of the, the tiny similarities and then the big differences, but still that idea of humility, perhaps in a human sense, that we can understand a little bit better. We'll skip a few verses to keep on track with the lesson, uh, but I'd encourage you to take the time to read the entire chapter two of Philippians, or even the entire book. It's such a wonderful book. Uh, so if you want to read that sometime this week, I know it will be an encouragement to you. But let's pick up in verses 13 through 15. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Oh my goodness, look at this wonderful passage. I love it. First of all, we see in this verse 13 that God is working in us. We're not on our own. The Lord is working in us and he enables us to do these things. He even gives us the desire to do these things. And also he has a purpose for us. This goes back to the first verses of the chapter, which talk about the encouragement of Christ 
and the purpose of, of um, the unity of the believers, the encouragement, and the fulfillment that we find in that. So that ties right back into that first verse. But now look at this verse 14. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Oh my goodness, that really needs no explanation, right? But how difficult is that to do? I have tried at different points in my life to just make it through a single day without a single complaint. And I don't really think of myself as a person who complains a lot or a person who grumbles or argues a lot. But when I set my mind to, okay, 24 hours, no complaints, I realize that I complain a little bit more than I like to admit. And so that is a good, um, that's a good thing to try. Can you make it through a day without a single complaint, even in your thoughts? Uh, and certainly that would be a wonderful thing. And it would let us indeed shine like stars in the world. We are in a dark world, a crooked and perverted, perverted generation, this passage says. We're in a dark world. We want to be examples. We want to shine like stars. That is a beautiful picture and something that, um, that we can aspire to. I, I love this passage. I want to shine like a star. Don't you? I know that you do. So let's not grumble, not complain. And that will make us stand out for, for sure. I want to look briefly at verse 17. This is a wonderful verse. Um, Even as I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. The drink offering was an interesting offering. I don't know a lot about it, but from what I understand, it was a drink poured out on certain types of sacrifices, not, not every type, but certain types of sacrifices. And in the heat of the fire that went along with the sacrifice, the drink offering just evaporated and it went into nothing and this is really a beautiful picture of humility because again it's not just giving ourselves up for some recognition or giving ourselves up for some reward it's really just giving ourselves up it's that idea of evaporation we really become nothing it goes back to the idea of john the baptist saying he christ must increase i must decrease we need to be willing to just pour ourselves out so that we become nothing. We evaporate, if you will, in the service of Christ and others. And that, to me, is such a beautiful, beautiful picture of what the Lord would have us do. So, as always, I like to look at a few applications for the week. So let's do that. First of all, it would be so good to find someone specific this week to encourage or to console. Recall that first passage that we looked at in Philippians 2, at the very beginning verses, which basically says, since Christ provides us with encouragement and comfort and affection and mercy, let's do the same for others. So do something specific this week to encourage or comfort someone. And I think you would find that to be such a blessing for yourself as well. Also, fix your eyes on Jesus. That application I can get all, out of almost any passage because we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus. And as we do that, so many other things will fall into place. The focus of this lesson is to yield ourselves so that we can serve others in humility. Uh, but we can do that only as we fix our eyes on Jesus and look to him. So I, I love this thought. It's just a beautiful, beautiful um, phrase from the book of Hebrews. And also, here's a great application. Now, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to challenge myself. It's been a couple years since I've tried this, so I'm ready to try again. I'm going to challenge myself to go a full day without any complaints. Oh, goodness. I'll try to report back to y'all next week. I don't know if I can do it or not, but I'm certainly going to try. Um, that is really a wonderful thing to do. And it would, it would bless you, bless others, bless the Lord, and it would help us shine like stars in the universe for sure. In closing, I want to say one more thing about the book of Philippians. I have a very dear godly friend in Nashville who has memorized the entire book of Philippians. Uh, she quoted it for me one evening many years ago, and I remember the pleasure I felt at just sitting and watching and listening to those words of God uh, pour over my spirit. Uh, it brought me great joy just to hear her quote the book of Philippians, and it is a beautiful book. Again, I hope you'll read the entire thing this week. It will bless you if you do. And as always, I pray for you this week. I pray God's blessings upon you as you yield in humility to him. Take care and God bless you.